say like you're mumbling again, Joshua, which happens. Uh, and I'm and I'm trusting that you'll be patient with me as I make my way through uh, this this uh, the, the interface. As if you joined early, you'll know there's a little bit of a tech glitch, which is to say I have a, a, a series of slides I want to use. Some are text, some are charts. Um, I have the, the my way of moving among them is a bit awkward right now, and moreover, it may take a little bit of uh, hunt and peck, and I'll sort of have to guess because the slides all have names like XXX and N3, and so it's a, a little bit guesswork, but we'll get there. Uh, I'm really glad uh, we uh, to be invited to do this, and it's sort of exciting to uh, you know, I, I always have said in my, in my, I've been teaching for about 15 years now, that the fundamental difference is teaching uphill and teaching downhill. When people are sort of self-selecting and want to be there, it's, it's, it's teaching downhill, right? And it's a real pleasure. I'm grateful to everyone. Uh, and I know many of you are teachers as well, uh, which is always reassuring uh, from, uh, from this perspective. I'm going to sort of, first I want to sort of set forth how I plan to proceed uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get into it. As, as you all know, there's two sessions, one uh, today and one a week from today. And they do move sequentially, although today's session means to cover about 400 years. And <laughs> next week's session means to cover about 36 months. Uh, that's, that's perhaps a bit of an exaggeration. But what I want to do today is set forth a sort of historical account of the riot and particularly the logic by which the riot returns in the recent three years or eight years or 25 years, uh, you know, in the recent period. Uh, so I want to set forth sort of the long durée logic of that along historical materialist grounds, which should bring us more or less to the present and uh, with, a, with a theoretical framework to conceptualize what's happening in the present. And then next week, I'm hoping we can have a chance to discuss uh, the implications of that and how we might imagine on, uh, political struggle unfolding uh, over, over the course of the, both looking at the last few years and imagining the next 10 years, who knows. Uh, so that's my rough shape. So what I'm going to do uh, in today's session, we have about two hours, a little bit less, is probably more or less talk through first some conceptual frameworks, then my own argument. After each sort of section or module, I'll pause and see if people have questions, want to have a little conversation. Uh, and uh, so there'll be two or three pauses. I would also imagine maybe around 11, we should take a break for three minutes so people can grab more coffee or whatever they need. It may be late night where you are. It's still the morning for me. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is note the sort of some of the main contemporary models we have for thinking about the return of the riot uh, and then set forth my own sort of orienting points theoretically and then launch into my own account. Is that, we doing okay so far? I sort of that as a, as a framework. So I'm seeing like 15 minutes of talking uh, by, of, of me going through something, conversation, repeat that, and then we'll have some open time at the end for people to have questions, uh, comments, skepticisms, long polemics, whatever you want, really. Uh, OK. So uh, the slide that's up on the screen right now is from, I think, one of the most important recent books that takes the return of the riot seriously. I imagine some of you will have seen this book, uh, which is The Rebirth of History by Alain Badiou. Um, the breadth of things about which Badiou writes is is endlessly stunning, and uh, it was, in that sense, perhaps not surprising that he recognized uh, yeah, at a fairly early moment the significance of the return of this sort of mode of political contestation and set forth a, a fairly complex account of it. Um, it's not an account I agree with, I should say outright, but I found it incredibly useful. And I want to sort of note what, for me, is the most important aspect of Badiou's approach. As he's going through these riots, if you've read the book, you know a lot of it is talking about the Arab Spring. He correctly identifies those as, as, uh, as riotous events. His, the rationale for what we call a riot is going to be something I'll get to fairly soon. Um, 
But so Bad is uh, the thing, you know, the thing that is most salutary about his account is unlike many commentators on the left, I won't name names, although I could, he really didn't have a paternalistic account of like, well, of course we can understand and sympathize with downtrodden people, uh, which sort of had an assumption that riots were oh, overly spontaneous, pointless, a mistake, uh, a sort of indisciplined eruption. And we should be understanding about them, but of course they weren't real politics in some sense. And Bedu notably did not take that position. Uh, his position has been that they're to be understood in quite serious political terms uh, as actual modes of political struggle. Obviously, he, he thinks that any given street riot or, or whatever lasting for a day or three days or five days is not uh, the same as a revolution. I think we'd probably all have to agree with that. Uh, but he takes them quite seriously as expressions of the circumstance of struggle and part of politics, not a, not a sort of a moment of exception uh, or eruption from it. And, and I, I uh, want to hold on to that understanding while noting how intensely his account is one which is from political theory. So, in fact, in his attempt to historicize riots, to periodize them, as you can see in this passage, his account is that riots come entirely out of a failure of politics. There's been some gesture toward uh, political struggle, um, potential revolution. It's been contained. It's failed. Uh, there's no organizing idea which can structure people's uh, revolutionary urge, their desire to fundamentally change the world they live in. And uh, so you get the, 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 the riot becomes the way in which this disorder starts to try and figure out what it wants to do, lacking that, that magnetizing idea. So it's sort of a purely political sequence. Now, the other main idea about how riots work these days is is quite the opposite of this. It's an extremely positivistic, economistic account, which essentially indexes riots to food prices, so identifies them as, as food riots. Now I have to sort of try and, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, find a slide and maybe I will succeed in finding it. Maybe I won't. No promises. Let's see. Mm. Yeah, so I don't know how well you can see this. I know we can zoom in on it in certain ways. So here's a here's a classic positivistic chart from the, oh, I think they're called the New England Institute for Complex Studies or some name like that. Are people able to see that slide, the chart, the food, the food price slide? You can see when we zoom in. Great. So here's the chart and you can see it too notes that there's a resurgence of riots. Uh, worldwide, particularly in this period running up from 2006 or 2007. Uh, most of the riots it notes are not in the capitalist core, and I'll return to that point in a, a minute or two. Uh, and it, and it, the, the claim here is just sort of, you know, food, the food price index that's over a certain level, the, the cost of food, and people riot. So this is a fundamentally apolitical, you could say, a set of claims. It's merely about the capacity to feed a population. And this is more or less in keeping with the oldest sense of, of riots we have, which is that the, the basic mode of a riot is the, the bread riot. Um, the bread riot here, I'm going to zoom back out so we can sort of have these two models, the Badu model and the, the uh, positivistic model sort of set against each other. Uh, okay, so this idea, this sort of positivistic idea that riots are, are all basically bread riots has a real basis in history. And it's now that I want to make the leap back from the present to 1600, more, uh, more or less. And the date that we choose is always going to be a, a point of a contention for, for some people. It's, it's hard to know, I think, when riots as a category come into being. In some sense, the idea of people without a specific political policy uh, 
rising up and fighting in the fighting in the streets and and doing whatever it is they do is as old as civilization, if not if not older. So it'd be strange to say, well, riots begin at a certain point. Nonetheless, our our historical accounts of riots tend to begin in the 16th, 17th century. Uh, before that, yeah, significant events tend to be thought of as peasant uprisings. Uh, usually against whoever the land owner is on whose land they're living. Um, they're, in fact, in some sense, an interesting hybrid of revolution and riot. Uh, often they involve the, the production of free cities. Uh, this is most common in the West in Italy, uh, but certainly in France, other places. Uh, and these, in fact, interestingly, I think this is a quite important thing to note. These free cities in Italy get called communes, right, communes. Uh, who you get these peasant uprisings, they throw off the Lord and, de and declare themselves these, these free communes. This idea of the commune um, obviously is going to return to us in the 19th century and perhaps uh, in, the, in the present. I see I got a, a question coming in. I'm not sure I'm quite nimble enough to handle questions as we, as we go, but I can try. Someone's, uh, David's asked if there's a particular scholar or group of scholars arguing this position. There are many, actually, uh, but they're not the scholars we would recognize in the world of theory. They're, they're social scientists. Uh, that This is the dominant mode in, in, in social science, uh, uh, is to understand these in fairly positivistic ways. You get all kinds of different organizations. There are some discussions to take Daniel's question, and then I'm going to try and get back to the presentation. There actually there absolutely are some, some identifications of the food justice movement. Um, with this history of, of, uh, of contemporary riots. And I think we'll probably touch on that uh, next week a bit. Some fairly, some, some fairly interesting work about uh, food autonomy is how it's often, often put and the struggle, for, the struggle for food autonomy and thus a delinking from, from uh, global, global food and capital structures uh, as, as part of this struggle. And we might get a chance to get to this next week. Anyway, to get back to this sort of origin of the riot, uh, when you get the, the sort of the decline of feudalism, the peasant uprising goes with it, and you start to get this category which is identified and named as the riot. And this really starts to happen quite consistently. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. As, as uh, Daniel intimated, I don't start as a historian. All I have is historians uh, who I build on. Uh, but the the clear identifications of riots seem to start maybe around 1580, maybe around 1630 in that period. And I want to stress that the part of the, I'm not looking at the entire globe right now. I'm looking at the uh, capitalist core, the places where the industrial revolution has its run up and take off, which is where the changes I'm tracking tend to happen first uh, in this period and then follow unevenly in the rest of the globe. We now have it almost entirely, uh, a globe almost enti entirely internalized to the logic of capital. And, and so I would argue that the argument I'm making applies in various ways to that entire structure, to the entire globe. But I really am, uh, the historical claim I'm making focuses on uh, England, France, the United States, Germany, Italy, places where you get the, the early capitalist uh, takeoff. But before that takeoff happens, the riot is really the dominant form of uh, social struggle. The historian Charles Tilley is the leading example of this. Uh, one of our great historians has this, the, this term of repertoire of struggles. He argues that any, in any society, there's actually a whole bunch of ways that people struggle, uh, which he calls the repertoire of struggles, but that uh, at any moment, there, there tends to be a, a dominant form, a leading form of struggle, which sort of uh, is the way, way things are most likely to go, that organizes the other struggles. And in this period, the 17th and 18th century, uh, centuries in England, France, West, Western Europe, and then the United States, the riot is clearly the leading form of, of struggle in the, in the repertoire of struggles. Uh, and that stays true for a while, and then it starts to get replaced by the strike. The strike becomes the dominant um, uh, tactic in the repertoire of struggles, 
and this happens at different times in different countries. The window is probably 1795 to 1835, more or less. Uh, and we start to get a replacement. Uh, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show a quite, I think, oddly humorous passage suggesting that, that transition, if I can, if I can track it down in a minute. But I want to first touch on what turns out to be a huge problem for talking about riots, which is actually defining what a riot is. And there's a lot of uh, puzzling around. So I'm curious. Um, in fact, let's let's do it in the in the chat section. So not with microphones. When people think riot, what do they think are the fundamental characteristics of riot? I'm sort of curious to hear if people want to type in what what for them are the defining characteristics by which you can identify a riot. This gives me a chance to drink my coffee. Thanks very much. Well, one thing is uh, it's collective behavior that's uh, improvised, um, <laughs> has violent undertones, Violent undertones, or I think most people would often argue, uh, overtones. Over, yeah, overtones, exactly. Like, uh, quite, quite violent, um, in its nature. So people are typing in some really useful things. Um, I can already tell I'm dealing with people who are probably smarter than I am, but, uh, I'll do my best to keep up. So uncontrolled motion is a really interesting claim. Um, exhaustion with existing conditions. Uh, that's, I think that's certainly the case. Anger, violent undertones or overtones. So these are some, some useful coordinating uh, ideas. I think they're quite common. Gregory Adler has it as not as a political category, um, but has bearing on resistance. Uh, someone who apparently hangs out with my friends has identified it as smashy, uh, which sounds like a which sounds like a comic book term, but it's actually a, a term of art in anarchist circles, which I won't go into in too much detail. Um, but I certainly know what it means. Uh, um, so now I'm going to say my counterintuitive thing, which is that actually there's almost no relationship between uh, riots and violence, or there's no logical relationship. Certainly people have that association, and we have to take that association seriously. If, if you know, if four billion people around the globe associate violence and riots, there's something real to that association uh, at which we would have to take quite seriously. That said, in my distinction, uh, which I wish I could claim to have invented on my own, but which I'm largely going to draw from the historian E.P. Thompson, uh, riots uh, are not fundamentally associated with violence. Indeed, strikes, people forget this, are often extremely violent. Uh, this changes from place to place. In China right now, uh, what people call a strike is, would, would, would be very hard for us to identify uh, as a uh, um, as a strike and looks more like a riot. It's filled with violence. Uh, and so I think it's actually kind of hard to, to just uh, say, well, riots, violent, strikes, nonviolent. Well, that's the image we have, right? Strikes have that sort of almost ascetic uh, feeling of, of immobility, right? People refusing to do things, whereas riots are indeed filled with sound and fury and all this, all this motion. Uh, and, uh, but I think that turns out to make it, it very hard to tease apart what a riot and a strike is. Now, E.P. Thompson has an incredibly useful distinction going back to this tradition in the 16th and, uh, 17th and 18th century of the bread riot, which is indeed the main, uh, organization of the riot then. So I'm going to now again try and see if I can call up an E.P. Thompson passage. It's not clear to me I will succeed. Uh, let's see if I do that one. Hey, not bad. Uh, so this is him uh, starting to narrate the history of riots. And he identifies them with a regional consciousness. This will turn out to be quite important. He mentions these blockades. This is all about the export of bread and flour uh, that he's talking about as he starts to detail these early riots. Uh, let's see if I can go. What if I get to that one? Then I'm adding. Uh, he here he gets a, a so, so further details, and I want to note some specific things about this this account. Uh, let's see if I can in fact 
centered a little bit. Not bad. There we go. Um, so he says not just he doesn't want to limit it just to these squabbles outside uh, London bakeries, but these discontent with large millers, these risings of the people. He gives us a bunch of dates in which colliers, tinners, weavers, and hosiery workers were prominent. What's remarkable about these insurrections is first their discipline, and second the fact they exhibit a pattern of behavior whose origin we look back several hundred years. So I want to note a couple interesting things about this uh, about Thompson's description. Uh, one is that uh, he wants to move from sort of squabbles to risings of the people to politicize them. Another is that he identifies them with discipline. This is important, right? The association with violence is also is often an association of indiscipline, where riots are 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 indisciplined and strikes are are disciplined activities. That turns out to have huge implications for us, which is to say, the logic of strike as discipline goes with the logic of of you know, mass class party of strikes being labor organizations that are going to take on the structure of political organization, discipline themselves, become political parties, and so on. So the association of strike with discipline turns out to be in this logic of political organization, which assumes that riots are not politic politically organized. Uh, and Thompson wants to take issue with this. Now, the other thing that's important about this passage, I think, is that he mentions a series of kinds of workers, colliers, tinners, weavers, hosiery workers. But, and this is very important, they do not appear as workers. So workers take part. The distinction can't be made between riots and strikes as to whether or not workers take part. That's another way people try to make the distinction. It's a question of whether workers take part as workers or not. So when workers take part in an action as workers, when they shut down production, when they down their tools, we can define that as a strike. Uh, and absent those, we're looking at a riot. But that still doesn't tell us what a riot is. And here Thompson makes his vital distinction. And I think this is one of the, the, great, the great insights. Uh, he says, looking at the, these bread riots, he says, riots are the setting of prices in the marketplace, uh, whereas strikes are the setting of prices in the workplace. The setting of the cost of commodities is a riot. The setting of the cost of labor is a strike. This is a stunningly clear uh, distinction which actually throws, throws many things into relief. So we can then start to say, well, if a bunch of people struggle over the cost of bread uh, or uh, the cost of really any, com any commodity in the marketplace, We'll take that as a riot. Maybe it's organized, maybe it's disorganized, maybe it's violent, maybe it's not violent, but it's a struggle over the ability of families, really, to get access to the things they need to stay alive, to reproduce themselves. That's taken to be a riot. Whereas if it's a struggle over how much the laborer will receive, either in, in pay or in uh, working conditions, or if it's a struggle over those, then we call that a, a, a strike. And as soon as we do this and make a sort of marketplace, workplace distinction, we have a pretty clear, not just distinction, but a rationale for why you get this transformation between 1795 and 1835, right? The replacement, and this is so straightforward by now, it may not even be worth saying, uh, but the, the shift from a riot-led repertoire of struggles to a strike-led repertoire of struggles is simply identical to this to the rise of the wage form and of, of the, uh, the the industrial capital and the industrial workplace. And as more and more people are internalized into the wage uh, and internalized into the organized workplace, the strike comes to replace the riot. So do people more or less follow that so far? In fact, I can tell people do from the conversation on the side. Uh, um, people seem to be already trying to, to race ahead. Um, and I think that uh, I'm hoping that these are issues that we might want to hold on to and, and even get to uh, later on rather than racing ahead too much. So um, if we can sort of maybe try and stick with the argument as it unfolds, uh, we'll, we'll have a chance to sort of look at things that seem like they might be exceptions uh, and certainly we'll have many opportunities uh, to, to get to those. But people are more or less more or less tracking this price setting in the in the in the space of the market, price setting in the space of 
of, uh, of the wage uh, uh, distinction that, that Thompson makes. Okay, now this is still more or less framework. This I'm still borrowing from, from Thompson. And I wanna add two more frameworks in now, although it's possible people are mostly familiar with them. One is directly from Marx, and it deals with the category of surplus population. And the other is from Arrighi, and it deals with sort of the long durée of the development of capitalism and the cycle that follows. So I'm guessing many of you are familiar with the category of surplus population from Marx. I'm gonna whip through it quite quickly. I'm gonna try and find what I think is the pivotal passage from Marx. Um, yeah, it's looking to me like, like, well, could it be this slide? No, it's definitely not that slide. <laughs> um, if only Marx had charts that lucid, it would be slightly more enjoyable to read capital. Uh, yeah, uh, let's see. So it could be, um, see if I can get it to be that one. No, that's more bad you. Yeah, I warned you this was coming. Ay, ay, ay. Can I just, can I just assume everyone has memorized the Grandrisa? I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can hope. I mean, you know, if we were serious people, we would have all memorized the Grandrisa. There it is. Okay. So, I mean, this is a microgloss on a very long argument in Marx. I'm going to try and summarize it as, as uh, swiftly as I can. Uh, so, I'll, I'll just sort of, sort of read it, right? Capital presses to reduce labor time to a minimum while it posits labor time as the sole measure and source of wealth. So he's stating what's a rather long argument in, in capital, which essentially goes that, that, that among the fundamental contradictions in the logic of capital's unfolding, uh, a critical one, the one that causes crisis is as follows. On the one hand, surplus value, which capital needs to survive, uh, comes from the exploitation of labor. On the other hand, capital is compelled to expel labor from the production process. Uh, once, it, once it gets in motion, and I'm sure you know the logic fairly well, which is to say, I run a sweater factory, I'm competing with another sweater factory, uh, they bring in a more efficient sweater making machine, uh, which allows them to undercut my cost of sweaters. Um, I have no choice but to borrow money and buy uh, an equally efficient or more efficient sweater making machine, which I do, that displaces labor, that's what efficiency means. It takes fewer people to tend the machine. My investment in the machine, I make back over time. My competitor gets an even more efficient sweater maker, you know, the Sweaterator 3, uh, and expels even more labor from the process. So we're in this endless fratricidal war of developing ever more and more efficient sweater making processes. And meanwhile, the laborers are getting increasingly expelled from the process. So capital, in, in Marx's account, the logic of capital is compelled to expel living labor, he calls it variable capital, of course, from the process. Uh, and so you get a growth of relative surplus population. Relative surplus population means people who are essentially uh, either uh, underemployed or unemployed, uh, who are increasingly removed from the process. So we see a sort of, uh, oscill oscillating is the, wrong, is the wrong term, although they're all are small historic oscillations. But we see a sort of a tidal motion. That was the analogy I wanted. A tidal motion, uh, where at the beginning of capitalism's takeoff, the Industrial Revolution, 1784, the steam engine, right, and it, it sort of it really takes off there. Uh, there's a massive internalization of former peasants into the capitalist production process, and that that rises for a while. And then as a, as, a, as a long tendential factor, it starts to decline. Capital starts to produce more and more surplus population till we get to the present. And there's a massive uh, surplus population on the globe. Now, I don't know if anyone's read the Mike Davis book, which is called uh, Planet of Slums. Quite an interesting book, very data heavy uh, and just shocking with its accounts of, you know, uh, 10 million unemployed people living in a, uh, a ring around Mumbai or around Dhaka around Sao Paulo 
each of those places, more than 6 million people, utterly surplus with no uh, engagement with the formal, uh, formal economy. So this is a long-term account in which labor is first internalized and then expelled uh, from capital. Oh, my God. And then people put up links. This is amazing. Um, thanks, Daniel. <laughs> um, uh, this this, this uh, first the internalization and the expulsion of, of labor from, from capital. And that shape, like rise and fall, is really the shape we're tracking here. In fact, the long... The big structure, the first way I like to describe the big structure I'm working on is riot strike riot, right? So we have the period of riot, 17th, 18th century. It gives way to the strike uh, in, in, in this period. Uh, I've already mentioned it, you know, 1820-ish. Uh, and then, as, as I think we all know, often uh, in a way that seems greatly sort of melancholic for those attached to the labor movement, we see a massive decline in strikes starting in different places in the 50s, 60s, dramatically in the 70s. Um, and so that by the time of the 90s or the last couple of decades, there's essentially no strikes on a large scale. If you talk large scale is often like thought of as involving a workforce of more than a thousand, those essentially no longer exist uh, in, the, in, in the United States and in the West. They're extraordinarily rare. Whereas the riot in the Western world has been increasingly more common since about 1979. Uh, so strikes really decline, rise, or riots really rise again, and we're back in the period of the riot. So that's our, our basic shape, riot, strike, riot, although I prefer to put it as riot, strike, riot, prime. Uh, a little Marxist joke, right, that riot, when riots return, they have to return changed. And I think our current period of riots is quite a fundamentally different and doesn't match up perfectly to the period of riots in the 17th and 18th century. And that, of course, I think is what next week's discussion wants to be about, right, is, is not just like, oh, we've come back to riots, how interesting, and we can theorize it, how interesting, but in what way is the new period of riots structurally different from the original period of riots, uh, and what might that portend uh, for how things are going to go? So... How are people doing? I feel like I might need to take a breath, um, and then I'm going to I'm going to launch into the the Arigi World Systems Theory. I'm going to try and give a quick summary of it, uh, and uh, um, and but I wonder if people want to ask any questions now. People people should feel welcome if they want to put on their microphones and and ask any questions they have. And let's maybe take five minutes to chat about the framework as it's developed so far. And I might also tinker around looking for my next slides. No questions? Hi, uh, Joshua. This is Sigrid. I, uh, hi, Sigrid. Hi. Uh, I wondered about this notion of the food rights as being completely apolitical. I, I find that sort of problematic. Tell me more. What, tell me more about what you mean. Well, uh, harking back to uh, feminism, that uh, the personal is political. So I, I, I think uh, I would say that, you know, there is no such thing as the apolitical. Yeah, I actually agree with you completely. Uh, when I say ap uh, apolitical, I sort of mean in the account of... Uh, these complex systems folks, these social scientists, who, you know, for all I know, that they, in the privacy of their own homes, would agree with you. But there's a certain mode of data-driven social science, right, that uh, isn't interested in the political because they feel it gets them into territories that are a bit subjective for them. And their point is, like, no matter what what's on people's minds or what people think, we can, we can assume there's going to be riots given certain... Uh, certain data conditions are satisfied, right? So I, so I think they, their pretense is that it's apolitical. I agree with you entirely on several different grounds um, that it's entirely political. <clears throat> the distinction I'm trying to make, I guess, uh, is a distinction from 
the political as is sort of implied by political theory or by sort of a Badiouvian account of like there's these political cycles, right, of, of you know, leading up to 1848 in France. For That's an example, right, where there's a, a prolonged period of political foment and it breaks out into open political struggle between uh, parties, between classes. Uh, it, it comes to a head. It has a dramatic conclusion. And then for him, in the, once that series, for him, it's always a sequence, right? Once that sequence ends, uh, um, then, then, then people have no political orientation. So that's like his sense of political is a sense of more or less shared social values and projects that people enter into collectively um, out of a, out of a sort of a subjective condition, whereas the, the, the complex systems folks uh, which, if that's what politics is, the complex system folks are having none of it. Now, I think we want a different model of politics from either of those, frankly. And the fact that you've hit on the example of feminism uh, and, and the identification of, a, of the personal, the sphere of the personal as political, I think is going to turn out to be uh, vital. And so I really want to hold on to that. And maybe um, I, I promise we'll come back to that in considerable detail. Uh, Gregory has asked a question, so what counts as a riot and what doesn't count as a riot? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that, that, I think it's not clear in the current period. And again, I want to hold off on reaching conclusions about this, let's say, post-1979 era that we're in. But for E.P. Thompson, uh, before that moment, what counts as a riot is if people are struggling to set prices in the, in the marketplace, right? So people can't afford what they need to survive, uh, whether it be bread or, um, I don't know, what do people need besides bread? Like bread is an allegory, right? Bread is just a, is, is the, is a placeholder for, uh, the good people need to reproduce their own lives. And if people can't afford that, that and go out into the space of the market to seize that or, and this is quite interesting, right? We often, we, we tend to assume bread riots are just people rushing in and grabbing bread. They're actually, we're very rarely that in the 17th, 18th century. You get people going into the marketplace, very often led by women. This is a striking fact, right? Very often led by women, uh, and saying to the baker, uh, or the, the guy who runs the syndic, the, 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 the baking syndic most often, uh, you're charging too much. We need you to charge considerably less. Uh, for bread if we're going to make our way in the world and they they uh they pass it along this information with considerable threat of force and um hopefully they are heard uh and the syndic says uh gotcha there's going to be big trouble if we don't lower the price of a baguette to whatever it is so in fact in countries where we still see controls on bread prices which are quite familiar as i'm sure you know right france still has controls on bread prices there's still various controls on tortilla prices and various other kinds of items in the bolsa in Mexico. All over the world, we still have these, these controls on bread prices. And that's a direct outcome, right, of these, of, of riots, of the history of riots and people saying, uh, if, if, the, if the prices get too high on subsistence goods, we can't, we can't, we can't subsist. Uh, so we need you to keep them low. Uh, so, so that would define a riot. And a strike is when people say, if that's the money you're paying us, doesn't give us enough wages to go buy the things we need. Uh, we need you to pay us more or to treat us better. I want to, I want to hold on to that too, right? It's not just wage demands, but it's also, uh, workplace, workplace condition demands. But if, so uh, the presence of those demands would define a riot, a uh, sorry, sorry, a strike, just as the demand for affordable subsistence goods would define a riot. David, I see you have a question. Yeah, I was, um, uh, your your uh, your notion riot strikes riot riots is very intriguing. What specifically would you argue was going on during the period of time where the strike was predominant? That riots were less um, in evidence or were less influential? Because um, certainly they continue to have an existence. Um, yeah. So I was wondering how you see that relationship and what it is that's actually in flux, you know, between these three distinct punctuations. In yeah, time. yeah that, that's an important clarifying question. And I worry that it does often sound like I and maybe other people are overstating the case. Riots do indeed persist. 
uh, and probably uh, during the period, let's say 1820 to 1979, which is dominated by the strike in the, in the West. Uh, riots absolutely persist, persist, just as strikes have persisted. It's not like strikes suddenly ended in 1979, right? Uh, uh, it's more of a question of what the, of what the leading tactic is, right? And, and indeed, we might suggest that as riots recede in that, in that period, 1820 to 1979, or maybe 73 is the date I often like to choose for very specific reasons. Uh, um, uh, it may, in fact, give them a chance to change and mutate, right? It's when they become a secondary or a tertiary tactic, they keep on existing, but they also, uh, because they're not the tactic that a society depends on in some sense to, to make its demands, uh, they're, they're at, uh, they, they tend to change in characteristics somewhat. So that I think there's probably a lot of reasons that when the riot returns in uh, as the leading form, uh, it, it, it comes to take on some quite different characteristics. Now, one of the ways that it, it, I think it notably takes on different characteristics, if we look at the countries uh, the, uh, in the capitalist or maybe post-capitalist core that I'm talking about, is that riots uh, for the last several years have a dramatically racialized uh, component to them, right? Which we, we can't really say about these riots in the 17th and 18th centuries we're looking at for the most part. In, in, in the recent period, indeed, there's often quite an antagonistic debate. You know, if, if, if someone were to make a strong uh, determinist claim, like, well, so it's about a restructuring of capitalism. And someone would say, well, no, really, this is a race question. It's a question about racism, racialized policing. That's what sets off all these, all these riots from the, you know, the, the riots around uh, Martin Luther King's assassination and that huge wave of riots uh, in the, during the, the period of the civil rights movement uh, in the 60s, the series of long, hot summers through the LA, you know, the LA riots in 92, the Tottenham riots in 2011, the Ferguson riots, right? Over and over again, it's about racialized policing uh, and the killing of, of, uh, mostly of black men uh, over and over again. And we want to note that, right, as a way that seems to distinguish the period of riot prime that I'm talking about from the period of riot six from 1630 to 1820 or what, uh, whatever my dates are. Uh, but no, riots never go away. They just recede a bit. Uh, they move into the background and then they return, as I think we've all discovered quite forcefully, as the fundamental moment in which uh, communities, towns, cities, societies start to ask a question of, of uh, what do we do about the intolerability of the situation in front of us? Uh, does, that, does that start to answer your question, David? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, lots of good questions coming up. Are boycotts subsumed under strikes? Are they a category of their own? Jeez, I don't know, Daniel. That's a really good question. What do you think? I mean, I think boycotts probably uh, don't have a, probably are not as broad a tactic uh, um, uh, as, as, as we might think. Um, uh, but I'm not sure I have a strong opinion about boycotts, except that I don't believe they're very effective. Uh, but, but actually, I, I, I'm not so interested in judging effectivity, right? I, I sort of wanted to, I should say, I'm interested in describing what happens. It's, it's going to, I know from experience that it's going to sound to a bunch of people here like I'm advocating riots, and especially after next week's conversation that I'm saying, like, riots are the proper form of political struggle. I'm absolutely not. I'm trying to offer a descriptive account of what I think is happening, what I think will happen, what struggle is going to look like, and why. That's what interests me. I have no interest in defending any particular tactic or strategy uh, in, this, in this conversation. Um, the question of at what place does riot move to terrorism and for whom from Kathleen is a really great question, too. Um, and I think the answer actually gets clearer every day. Right. I, I would I, I would imagine people have perfectly fine answers to this question. Uh, but I think the answer just gets clearer every day. Riots become terrorism. The more uh, the more anxious the government is. Right. The terrorism is just a governmental name for a certain intensity of political struggle. There is, no, there is no internal intrinsic definition of terrorism. It only has a structural definition in relation to the state. And as states are less able to purchase social peace, 
right, via, via various kinds of um, the social wage, right, the various kinds of programs and health care and unemployment benefits, the less states can purchase social peace, the more they have to compel social social peace with force, right? They move from hegemony to coercion in the classic distinction. Uh, and the more that they're compelled to maintain social peace by coercion, by sticks rather than carrots, the more they're going to start to name things as terrorism uh, because it has, because social struggle has to be taken as a as a political uh, police matter rather than as a, a social question that can be resolved by a, a wealth transfer, right? So um, I think that, that terrorism is just a pure name that has a lot to do with the state's given mode of maintaining social order. Um, the question of whether riot, when riot or strike moves to revolution, that I absolutely have to bracket. Um, always, never, sometimes, we'll talk about it next week. This is def definitely um, exactly, I think, such an important and big question that I want to hold off on that and not not leap into it. Is it okay with folks if I move into the Arigi framework now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. I appreciate your, your, your sticking with me. Now, it may be that a couple of you have encountered Arigi, Giovanni Arigi before. I'm going to try to summarize what is a 900 page argument in about eight minutes. That's a, a ludicrous thing to do. And so uh, you'll be aware surely that I'm giving you quite an incomplete and schematic picture. Fortunately, he's a quite schematic thinker in ways I find useful. Uh, and he comes from the tradition of world systems analysis, which is sort of the super big picture modeling of the history of world capitalism. Uh, it starts with the Annales School of History in France, notably the figure Fernand Braudel, the most notable practitioner of world systems analysis. I'm going to sort of throw out names in case people want uh, um, like to hear names of thinkers they like or want to hear names that they haven't encountered yet and want to I go to look into them. So it comes from Fernand Braudel. Uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein is the leading practitioner of world systems analysis. Giovanni Arrighi is maybe a bit of a heretic, or was, he died uh, five years ago, um, who eventually sort of renounced it, although not bitterly, I don't think. He just identified his own practice as somewhat different from the mode of Wallerstein and the leading practitioners of world systems analysis. But really, he starts as an economist. He's trained in Italy. He does his studies in West Africa on, on developing West African economies. He ends up teaching in a sociology program at Johns Hopkins, which is sort of the strange fate. If you're a heterodox economist, you can hardly be hired in an economics department and you end up in, uh, in these other places. So he ends up in the, in the sociology department. And the story he tells is, again, a, a usefully schematic one. He basically says, <clears throat> first of all, he does, he does a thing which many uh, Orthodox Marxists would disagree with, which is that he says, I'm not really that interested in some metaphysical argument about where capitalism really, really starts. I just want to know this thing. There have been four major, he doesn't call them empires. I'm going to use the word empire, which he might object to, but he's not around. Uh, there have been four major empires uh, going back in the last six centuries or so that have been historically distinct. They've been similar to each other, but different from all other empires, um, and that they provide a paradigm for understanding the structuration of the globe. So he makes this very nice distinction to start with, which is, you know, Marx has this, for, this the formula for the expanded formula for capital, which is MCM prime. So first there's an MC period, money to commodities, and then there's a CM period, commodities to money, but but more money. And Marx, Marx says that's the logic of capital, which he opposes to the logic of sort of non-capitalist economics, which is not MCM, but CMC, starting with commodities, turning it into money to get more commodities. And Arrighi does this neat magic trick where he says, I'm going to make that a, a, a spatial logic. He says there's two kinds of empires. One is TMT. So you start with territory, 
and you make money so as to take more territory. And your goal is to uh, gather in as much territory as possible, ideally the whole globe. So you can think of like Napoleon or Alexander the Great or any number of empires, right, where the goal is just to dominate all territory, eventually the entire globe. They always fail eventually. But so those are, that's a territorial logic that he says TMT. And then he says, at some point in history, you get this new kind of empire, which is uh, MTM. It takes territory only if it will make more money by taking that territory. So it's an economically centered empire and it won't expand physically unless there's a, there's a, 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 a sensible econ reason, uh, reason to believe that will allow for economic expansion. And if there, it won't allow for economic expansion, it will not expand. So he identifies these as this sort of new kind of imperial structure, uh, MTM, uh, which he identifies with capitalism, right? The capitalist empire is MTM, whereas the non-capitalist empire is TMT. Uh, and he says there have been four of these MTM empires in history, which he identifies with the Italian city-states and the chart I have in front of you, that's the Genoese, uh, who are the bankers of the Italian city-states. Then the Dutch empire, uh, the, the United, United Provinces, then the British empire and the US empire, uh, in which we currently reside. Uh, I don't actually have no idea if everyone currently resides in the U.S. who's in this chat room, but I, I apparently reside in the U.S. Um, so for Orthodox Marxists, right, only the latter two are part of capitalism proper, the British Empire, which takes off with the Industrial Revolution, and the U.S. Empire, uh, and that's actually not a necessary fight here just to put the Aurelian framework in place. Because what he notes is, about these empires that each empire itself follows the same internal pattern before coming to an end. Now I have to find another slide. Yeah, sorry that has that weird uh, blue bar there. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure why that's the case, but I don't think it will ruin our, our enjoyment too much. So here is his chart of the last 600 years, more than 600 years, in which he lists the four empires. Now I know this chart is a little busy, so I'm going to try to, can you all see my, like the red pointer thing that's working? I want to click in a yes if they can see the red. Yeah, okay, cool. This feels so technological to me. Uh, so we have these four empires. Here's the, what he identifies as the Italian city-states or the Genoese one right here. Then here's the United Province one. Then here's the British one. And then here is the US one up here. He identifies each of these as a so-called long century. Each one of these lasts something around 100 years, although as you'll notice immediately, they're getting shorter and shorter. Now, not only are they getting shorter and shorter, but they overlap. And this is, this is important to his structure, right? So we have the first empire here, and that, that's where it ends for him. But the second empire has already begun. This is the United Provinces, which goes all the way to here, more or less. Overlapping, here's the British Empire, which has already begun, which goes to here. And you'll notice that here's the US Empire. So they're overlapping empires. As any one empire declines, the next empire rises. Now, they're not empires in the sense of just being successful. The reason this would fall in the category of world systems analysis is they managed to organize the world around them. That is to say, it's in the interest of all the other nations within the economic system to go along with the sort of the big dog nation. That's his definition of hegemony, right? So that, uh, as long as the, the, the British Empire, let's say, is producing massive profits at a global scale, it's worth it for all these other nations to agree to go along with British power because they're taking some of that surplus as well, sort of working for everyone. But at some point, it stops working for everyone, right? The, the, the empire's ability to generate accumulation, uh, that's why they're called systemic cycles of accumulation. So to generate accumulation at a global scale declines, uh, it's no longer worth it for all those nations to go along with that nation. There starts to be struggles for power, periods of what he calls turbulence or volatility, in which a new hegemon 
uh, starts to arise. And they start to arise in a quite interesting way. And here's where we get to the important specifics. Uh, for Origi, based on quite elaborate historical research, this is not sort of just a theory, right? There's very heavy empirical research here. Um, these, the expansion of these nations is an industrial expansion, uh, more or less, and it, it, it's in which profit rates are very high. They're producing a lot of commodities, uh, but the profit rate declines uh, over the course of time. And everyone has their own theory of declining profit rate. Adam Smith has a theory. Ricardo has a theory. Marx has a theory. It doesn't matter so much. Arrighi's point is not so much here's why they decline, but that they do. You get this decline in industrial profits, and uh, then you get, you get correspondingly the rise of a financial period. So this last, in each, each period, is divided sort of into thirds, as you can see. Um, this last period from here to here for Italy, or here to here for the United Kingdom is a period in which finance leads the nation. There's no other way for the nation to make money. It's not making money industrially. It's not making money in the mercantile manner. It's making money through finance. It needs to keep making money to stay the hegemon, the big, the big dog. So it, it pours all effort into generating profit in finance. But as we know all too well, that can only last for a certain period of time. Finance is always a bubble. Eventually, the bubble blows. But while that nation is generating a lot of uh, money through finance, uh, it has to lend it somewhere. It's not going to lend it to itself because its industrial profitability is very low. So it goes looking around the globe for other nations where it can lend the money. And it finds a nation which is capable of industrial expansion. It lends it a lot of money in an attempt to turn a profit financially. But of course, that ends up funding the next hegemon's rise. So this exactly happens in the US. The US has a lot of industrial capacity in the late 19th century. All the mobile capital from Great Britain pours into the US uh, in search of profit. The US builds up its industrial capacity and takes off and sure enough supplants the United Kingdom as the, as the global power. So we have a series of cycles. We have empire, 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 but within each empire, we have uh, essentially three parts. It starts with a merchant phase in which there's largely mercantile circulation, industrial expansion, and then industrial decline and financial expansion, and then the end of the nation. Uh, the end, end of the nation's role as the, as the leading nation in the world system. So merchant, industrial, industrial finance as the three phases of, uh, of an, emp an empire's reign, rise and fall. Uh, Arigi notes that the beginning of the fall, the shift from industry to finance, always has a, involves a, uh, a major crisis, which he refers to as a signal crisis, indicating things have gone wrong. And then you have the financial period, and then it ends in what he calls a terminal crisis, from which the nation cannot recover and gives up its place as the leader of the world system. That is the Arigian structure. Uh, that is 900, 900 pages reduced pretty quickly. Now, I should note that uh, Arigi was given some pretty aggressive critiques. One of the main ones was from Hart and Negri. Uh, and uh, their, their, the critique goes, well, this is sort of just an eternal return, right? You're just saying this cycle plays out over and over again. Where does that have space for real transformation, for difference, for restructurations, aside from just this baton passing? And Arigi has quite an interesting answer for this. Well, his answer is, as is often the case, uh, well, Mr. Mr. Negri, Mr. Hart, you should have read my book more carefully. Uh, uh, he notes that each uh, empire um, has a, is different from the previous one. First of all, it has to start on a larger basis. So the first Italian city-state starts on a very small basis of like of cities. By the time you get to the U.S., it's a, you know, a continental empire, quite huge. If we imagine the next empire might be China, an even larger base. So you need progressively larger bases, and these, 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 these cycles are getting shorter and shorter. And that should uh, suggest to us that, right, that there is, there is not an infinite eternal return here. Because if you need a larger and larger basis, eventually you're going to run out of space, right? You're going to run out of globe to start a, a new empire on. And uh, if they're getting shorter and shorter, eventually they're going to come 
get, get so short they, they don't exist anymore. So Arigi's not claiming this goes on forever. In fact, he's noting this is lurching toward a limit. At what point can you no longer restart again at a, at a bigger scale? Now, of course, that description of the U.S. empire will be very familiar to many of you, the fact that we're in a period of financialization uh, in which finance capital dominates the U.S. That's largely where profits come from, industrial profit as a general fact is way down. And indeed, the, in, the industrial profit rate in the United States collapses in 1973, which is one of the reasons I'm so interested in, in, in that date. And so that's, that's this right here, right, where the red dot is. That's the, what, what Rigi would refer to as the signal crisis in the United States, the crisis of 73. All kinds of things happen in 73. You could probably make a better list than, than I could. Um, at a political level, it's the end of the Vietnam War, the Paris Accords are signed. It's the first oil shock, global profit rates decline. It's the process of detaching finally from the Bretton Woods gold standard. It's really a great moment of transformation. 73 is overly specific, maybe 68 to 73. But that's the moment when the U.S. empire shifts from being industrial to post-industrial, right? All this language we have of the U.S. being post-industrial, post-Fordist, flexible economy, all these terms we have uh, refer to the same thing, which is the transformation of the U.S. economy from industrial-based to a finance-based, uh, precisely as uh, Arigi would, would suggest. Uh, okay. So that's the Aregean framework, and now I want to add one more detail to it, uh, which I'm not sure I can go into as much depth as I might like, but I'm hoping uh, it will be adequate, which is this. So in political economy, there's a distinction made between, and again, some of this will, will some of you will, will know this quite well because you've encountered it before, some of you perhaps less so. There's a distinction made between profit and accumulation. So, for example, if all of us in this, uh, in, in this course were an economy, if we were an economy and uh, we all had $100 and $100 worth of uh, commodities, right, and we started trading them. So let's say, for example, I have, a, I have $100 and $100 worth of nails, and Daniel has $100 and $100 worth of hammers, and Ingrid has $100 and $100 worth of wood. Are you with me with the example? Oh, sorry, not Ingrid, Sigrid. I, I apologize, Sigrid. Um, has $100 worth of wood. So let's suppose, let's suppose I buy half of Daniel's, I've already, he has hammers. I buy half of his hammers for $50. And then I sell those hammers to Sigrid for $60. So I've done a classic thing, right? I've bought cheap and sold dear. I've made a $10 profit. Um, uh, Sigrid, I think, has done poorly. She, you know, she, she, she now has, she's made a $10 loss. There's been some redistribution of commodities. There's been profit. But the total amount of stuff in the system hasn't changed at all, right? The amount of hammers, nails, and wood that we're going to need to make whatever it is we're going to make, canoes, coffins, who knows. Uh, but that hasn't changed. The total amount of commodities and the total amount of money no change. So there's been no accumulation. The system hasn't grown. So this is a demonstration, right? That you can have profit without accumulation. That's, so that's like a zero-sum game, right? Mercantilism is a zero-sum game. And finance is a zero-sum game. Finance doesn't generate new value in the system. Uh, and in the, in the class political economic account, the only thing that generates new value, right, in the Marxian account is exploitation of labor. Uh, uh, the, it's the, the process of labor exploitation allows accumulation, which is why those periods of industrial capital in these, for these various uh, empires is a period of expansion uh, because it's an industrial capital and the exploitation of labor, you get this increase, whereas the mercantile period, I want to make my hand gestures here, I can't, 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 the mercantile period and the finance period, uh, you get profit, no accumulation, so the system's not growing. Uh, whereas in the industrial period, the system is growing. Phew. Uh, that's the Aregian structure. Uh, so let's take maybe another pause uh, and see if people have any questions they want to ask uh, at this point. And then I'll leap into my final, uh, which will turn out to be relatively brief, actually, 
taking of all these orienting theoretical uh, apparatuses and combining them into a quick yeah. story, story about riot. Story about riot. Sorry, say again. Sorry, say again. Uh, I'm not hearing the audio. I'm not variant. hearing the audio. Variant. Uh, what were the three? Uh, what were the three? Uh, Daniel, I saw the three. Uh, uh, three uh, yes, you mentioned. I'm suddenly getting a huge audio, audio, audio echo. I'm going to try turning off my microphone and turning it on again. All right, I'm trying my audio again. Seems to be working fine. So. Uh, Daniel Z has asked a question. What were the three shifts you mentioned? Uh, I'm not sure what shifts you mean. There's, ah, well, there's, so there's three periods of capital within each, uh, cycle of accumulation, right? So let's really look at the U.S. cycle up here. Uh, but we could go, you know, go back to any of these. The three periods are the, uh, the three periods are the mercantile, uh, where mer merchant capital is what leads the way, the industrial, uh, where the main, the, the leading uh, form of capital is industrial production, and then finance capital. And each of these periods can more or less be uh, subdivided into those three, merchant, industrial, and finance. Someone, I can't remember what theorist, very interestingly, refers to finance capital as cybernetic mercantilism. Um, I'm not sure I understand the implications of that term, but it seems useful to me in the sense that finance, like mercantilism, is zero sum, right? Some people make vast paper profits. Some people lose vast, like there's vast redistribution, but there's no new value being added into the system. Uh, so the, the linking of the, the, the end period and the beginning period uh, is that they're both zero sum, whereas the middle period is the period of expansion. Okay, now David yeah, Allen David has asked the jet clock question. I'm getting... All right, I'm, I'm trying to again restore the non-echo. David said, have you spelled out what the implications are for the Aurelian model for riots, or is that yet to be teased out? And that indeed leads me into the next moment of the discussion. So what are the implications uh, for a theory of riots over the long durée from the 17th century to the present of this Aurelian cycle uh, and of this logic of surplus population. And that's exactly what I want to try and uh, set forth uh, next and in, in some sense in conclusion. So uh, I want to now try and look at this picture I'm looking at and see if I can find a better slide. That's BBB. So I'm going to see if perhaps C, 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 C is a good slide. Uh, yeah, that's, that's quite useful. So here is just the last two cycles, the cycles that are part of capitalism proper, the long 19th century and the long 20th century of the, of the U.S. So as you, you can see, here's the British cycle. So this, this line right here is indicating the end of the United Provinces, but we need not worry about them too much. Although I'm super fascinated in the, the um the period of of, uh, of of Dutch global dominance I'm trying to educate myself more about it it's, it's quite uh, fascinating they invent the stock market among other things the first stock market in the world is in Amsterdam in 1604 uh, but um, so here's the British period here's the overlapping US period and that's the period of capitalism proper right so this I'm not sure where this dot is exactly supposed to be it looks like Origi has it maybe around 1750, uh, where uh, the British merchant capital, the, 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 the British East Indies and West Indies trading companies start to succeed in taking over the Dutch trade routes, and that's the, the sort of a merchant period. Then you get the industrial takeoff starting about here, which is, as I noted before, very shortly around 1784, if you want to give a specific date, uh, the date of the development of the steam engine and the possibilities of, of uh, large scale industrial production that that allows for uh, the various technologies. So that's the takeoff uh, there. And that's really turns out to be the period we're looking at, right? This is the transition. And that was that 
that annoying purple bar that was on the previous uh, slide I showed you was right in this period here, which is exactly the period of transition from strike uh, from riot to strike, the first transition. So we want to now ask the, the, in some sense, obvious question, why is the transition from uh, riot to strike the exact same thing as the transition from uh, merchant capital to industrial capital within the first major capitalist cycle? Um, and that would seem to be the, where we want to go with David's question about the implications of the Aurelian model. Why is it exactly that the historical transformation uh, that, that we see in which the riot is the leading form of struggle to the strike is leading form of struggle. And I've already intimated the basic answer as well, industrial takeoff, more and more people entering into the wage commodity system, working in the formal economy for, for their wage to earn their living, fewer and fewer people engaging in subsistence work, subsistence farming, other kinds of thing. And that seems like one way to answer the question. But I want to change the terms very slightly. Uh, the slight change in terms is actually the pivotal move. It's in some sense, here's the value added that I, that I give to these theoretical apparatuses I'm, I'm borrowing on. These three Aurigian periods can also be described as uh, periods in which first circulation dominates over production, or right? that's the mercantile phase when what you're getting is circulation of commodities, but it's not production heavy. Then you have a period where production dominates. That's, this is this MC period here. That's, that's, that MC means industrial production, money to, cap, money to uh, commodity, right? And, and endless pouring of all money into the two commodities of labor power and means of production. So this is a period of production. And then the finance period is again a period of circulation uh, in which capital is circulating around a lot, but it's not a, a productive phase. And so I redivide Origi's three periods to the period circulation, production, circulation. Uh, and then I make a further move, which is to look at the entire breadth of this, of this span, sort of the length of capitalism from its takeoff in the early British Empire to the present as being, as more or less having that shape of being circulation dominated in its earliest years up until Again, the Industrial Revolution starts to generalize and bring more and more people into the wage system. And production largely dominating then, since as British production fails, U.S. production takes off. But now we have a period dominated by circulation, by U.S. finance capital really dominating the globe. And so we're back to a moment of circulation. And it turns out this maps perfectly onto the historical structure of riot, strike, riot that we have, the periodizing of this, right? Riots up until whatever, you know, till, till, till Industrial Revolution begins, uh, strikes and dominating until the collapse of U.S. industrial production in 1973, and then the return of the riot. So that shape, riot, strike, riot, prime, is really the shape, circulation, production, circulation, prime. That's the shape we're looking at. So now I'm going to switch slides, switch, switch moods a bit, uh, and go through... Oh dear, these are in a completely bizarre order. I think we want to start with slide number five, see what happens. Oh, so this is all E.P. Thompson. We've looked at this already. So this is, we're now here looking at the, here's, here's the, the price setting claim, but we've already covered that more or less. Let's see if I can find slide six. Uh, uh, we've already looked at that stuff. We can go to eight. So here's Thompson narrating the, this first transition uh, in quite uh, beautiful, uh, melancholy tones for Thompson. We're coming to the end of one tradition and a new tradition has scarcely emerged. So we have the shift from the, to, toward the pressure on wages is becoming more vigorous. Uh, we start to get these various kinds of, of organizations. And the really interesting struggles we get in this period, for me, the most interesting struggles of this transitional period from riot to strike or circulation to production are the quite famous Luddite and Captain Swing uh, uh, struggles in England, which I assume most people are familiar with. Although, of course, 
the Luddites are, are the, that term has become so common that it's become so commonly misunderstood, right? People now often use Luddite to mean uh, someone who's technophobic, right? And doesn't, doesn't want to get with the modern world and, and technological uh, possibilities. But that wasn't the struggle of the Luddites at all. They, they didn't seem to worry much about technology as such. The Luddites were concerned about job loss, right? Um, and uh, this gets us back to that logic of surplus population that I talked about before, which is to say increasing automation of the economy is the same as uh, the generation of surplus population. And this is exactly the concern of the Luddites and, and of the Captain Swing riots in England in exactly this transitional period. This is all happening 1814, 1816, 1818, 1820, uh, exactly in the transitional moment. You get these Luddites and Captain Swing uh, groups running around and smashing spinning jennies, smashing various kinds of new weaving equipment that they recognize are going to are going to displace labor uh, from uh, the the wage. And so they see rising production, they see the displacement of labor, and you start to get this struggle against it. So we now want to ask the really interesting, difficult question: Are the Luddites or the Captain Swing actions? Are those riots or strikes? Now they are all identified as riots. In fact, people didn't really have the language for strikes at this at this time. Here's a great passage from from Charles Tilly in in France, which is quite fascinating about how people identify things, right? So it's an account of a riot um, in 1832, right? Uh, according to my deputy's report, does not appear to have any political overtones already, as Sigurd has noted long ago. That's a quite uh, Curious claim, a riot without any political overtones. And, you know, so writes a prosecutor two weeks after the July Revolution. It's a riot of textile workers who want to raise and pay, and by their own accounting, broke the windows of the main shops where they went in force to ask for written agreements about the raises. So not only is this almost certainly political, how can we imagine people demanding pay, uh, higher pay to be non-political? But it's probably not a riot. Right? The language of riot dominates, and the language of the strike barely exists. Uh, but by the Thompson distinction, it's pretty much of a strike. Right, They go in, and they demand a raise in pay. Uh, so it's a, it's a struggle over pay. They do the things like breaking windows. We had the phrase smashy before when people were asking what defines a riot. Smashy is the term of art for uh, when people go out breaking windows. Right, So, we, so this is a moment of smashy. But it's not smashy for the purpose of, of, of how we understand what riots were for in the 17th or 18th century. It's smashy for the purpose that we'll understand strikes to be for, which is demanding uh, pay raises. So some, there's some characteristics of a riot, right? It's not workplace. There's no downing of tools. But there's also real characteristics of strike. There's the workers appearing as workers. There's the demands about pay. So this is a classic transitional moment but it's totally unidentifiable. Right? This is utterly opaque to the people of the time. They, they don't know what strikes are in some sense and can't identify them. The riot is the only model they have. So this is this moment of transition in which we have a shift from struggles in the marketplace, right, which is the space of circulation by definition. Exchange is part of the sphere of circulation to the sphere of production, the industrial workplace. So this is, again, this is the exact sort of, if one wants to now, uh, transcode the terms of marketplace and workplace, riot and strike, it's really circulation and production. Market is a circulation space, workplace is a production space. So we have a shift in struggle from circulation to production in exactly this period. Uh, let me see if I can pull up a couple other slides. So, uh, yeah, this is just a series of images of production, uh, sorry, images of circulation. Here's, here's one of my favorite images of circulation, uh, a rather tragic cargo ship un undergoing great uh, difficulties. But so you see, as you can see, I sort of made the leap from that moment in 18, you know, 1814 in England, 1830 in France, when we have a shift from circulation to production, uh, which, which then happens across the, the world of capital. We have a shift back uh, uh, in the, in our era, post-1973, from production to circulation. So this is a model of circulation. 
if you think about the two great financial facts at a global level, post-1973, we have the rise of finance capital and we have the build out of shipping, of which this is an image of. And what I wanna note is these two huge transformations, the build out of shipping, the, you know, the Toyotaization uh, in which shipping and circulation become far more important, all our processes, capital leaks, leaps into circulation to struggle for profit by trying to decrease its costs, containerization, as we have this image here, the great transformation, the container ship. But finance is the same phenomenon. Finance is also a circulatory fact, right? Finance is not itself productive, but it helps us circulate things faster and faster. So if I have a sweater factory, you know, let's say I've made 100 sweaters, hypothetically, uh, I, I then have to like sell them and sit around waiting and the, and, then, and the process slows down to make my money back from the sweaters uh, before I can go back to the production process. But if I can borrow money from finance, I can speed up my process, right? I can, I can send those ships out. Um, I can do all my reinvesting. Finance smooths over the, the entire circulation process so there's no pauses waiting for anything to happen. So finance itself, and I wanna really insist on this because I can't uh, prove it, so I'm sort of argue by insistence. I can't prove it because I don't have time, basically. Finance is a technology of circulation, just as shipping is a technology of circulation. And you get this huge shift post 73 into the space of circulation. Uh, let's see if I have some more. I probably have a couple more images. Where's image 12? Maybe no image 12. Image 12, maybe a mirage. So some things to note about this shift from production to circulation that happens post-73. One, it doesn't mean strikes come to an end. Uh, as, as David pointed out earlier, riots continue during the strike phase, strikes continue during the riot phase. Uh, so strikes don't come to an end, but notably, strikes themselves move into the space of circulation. So Walmart is one of actually the biggest labor strikes we've had in the US in the last few years. And Walmart is also a space of circulation. Right? Walmart is a marketplace. They don't produce anything. They sell things that are produced globally all over the place, like Haiti, South Korea, China, Indonesia, many, many places where production has moved to. And Walmart helps circulate them. So that's so you get strikes that move into, into the space of circulation and other non-productive spaces. The Chicago Teachers Association strike right, was another substantial strike we had. Again, not in the space of production. The UPS workers strike was the other largest strike we've had in the US. Again, circulation strike, not production strike. Right? This has been a decisive fact that even as strikes continue to obtain, um, they happen more and more in the space of circulation and they have to be more and more be uh, repressed. There's the riot police, ironic name, right? That outfit riot cops, but they're moving in to break up a strike. Uh, um, the very same Walmart strike we're looking at in the upper left there's the cops moving in to break it up in the in the lower right. So strikes themselves do persist, but they too exist in the space of circulation. Let me see if I can go to my next image. Yeah, this is an image beloved to me. It won't be recognizable to all of you, but during the sequence, as Badu would say, of the Occupy movement in the United States, certainly the largest uh, organized action that happened in that in uh, in all the Occupy movements was the uh, Oakland port shutdown that Occupy Oakland engaged in where 25,000 people marched on the port of Oakland and blockaded it and shut it down, alas, for only a day. Uh, this is a, an image from the, the evening of that night of people sort of standing up on, container sh on, on shipping containers and, and waving flags. And we see again sort of that pure logic, right, of, of uh, struggles in the space of circulation. And that's essentially my claim. I think we've come to the end of my story, right? Which is to say, to understand why we go riot, strike, riot, we need only to recognize that capital itself has gone through a period, circulation, production, circulation. And that as capital struggles for profit in those spaces, political struggle, antagonism will move into those spaces inevitably. So that Riot is a form of circulation struggle. That's all, you know, that's, that's sort of the final formula. Strikes are production struggles, riots are circulation struggles. So in periods of circulation, 
you get circulation struggles of which the riot is the leading kind. But it's not the only kind. And here I'll make my turn. Because my claim is not that riots, that, you know, riots have come back. Everyone knows this. It's that we're in a period of circulation struggle and there'll be various kinds of circulation struggle. So the blockade is a costly example. And we saw some examples of that in the 17th century uh, and the 18th century uh, in, in which riots took the form of blockades, stopping the, the big bread syndics from sending flour or bread out of the, out of the parish, out of the county. And so the form of the blockade is, a, is, 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 is part of a logic of riot. And we're starting to see more and more blockades uh, as well uh, all over the globe. Uh, as, as a particular form of struggle. I think we might even think of all the, the movements of the squares, these occupations, those too are circulation struggles, right? They go into the space of the marketplace, the agora in that Greek, in that Greek term, which refers both to the town square uh, and to the marketplace. Well, that's exactly where Occupy New York, and Occupy uh, Oakland and uh, Syntagma Square and Puerto del Sol in Spain, all across the globe, right? These occupations of the squares are very much this model of a move into the space of circulation to try interfere with it as opposed to into the space of production. So that I think gives us a framework for the kinds of struggles where Olay, um, that this is, it gives us exactly a, a model for the kinds of struggles we can expect to see uh, over the next some number of years, the next, the next political horizon, especially in the post-industrial world. And I want to stress that claim, right? In places where production is still doing pretty well, China is a classic example, although it's not doing as well as some think. Uh, in places where production is still doing pretty well, we're more likely to see production struggles. In places where production is doing poorly, uh, the capitalist core, our post-capitalist core, we're likely to see circulation struggles. And that's more or less exactly what's been happening. The question is, what will those struggles need to look like to get anywhere? Uh, what forms could we expect them to take? And some obvious problems would be like, well, that part where you could get your subsistence goods in the riot, you could go down to the bakery and get your bread. We still see that, right? We still see looting as a very common phenomenon in riots, which people think of as Again, a kind of exception, a moment of indiscipline, something that's gone wrong. But if we think back, it's actually, that's the kernel of the riot in the 17th century. Riots are looting, right? You go to the bakery and you say, we need bread to survive. Uh, when we think riots, we should understand looting is their basic logic. And when we see looting in the current uh, period, we should understand it not as an exception, but as the basic logic of riots. Uh, but what looting can do in a space of global capital, as opposed to what it could do in a small town in, uh, you know, 1704, are quite different facts. And it's maybe on that that I should leave off uh, and open up the floor to questions in the, in the time left we have, since that's the basic setting for us. I guess I want to add one thing before I do that, because I haven't integrated uh, uh, part of my framework yet, which is that question of surplus populations that I talked about early on. So I'll note, right, that surplus populations means people who've been formally excluded from the wage. And we, the appearance of surplus population is the same thing as industrial collapse, right? Because if industrial growth and accumulation only comes from exploiting labor, but industrial development means expelling more and more labor from the process, the, the expulsion of labor, the production of surplus populations, is the same as the decrease in the possibility of accumulation. So when accumulation stops, that's the same thing as saying we've developed a lot of surplus population. Now, how can surplus population struggle? It's very hard for surplus population to go on to, to strike, right? Because they don't have a they don't have access to the wage, they don't have a formal workplace. Surplus population as political actors don't really have the strike weapon at their disposal. So they're going to struggle in other places. Surplus population actually can be involved in movements of the squares. It can be involved in blockades. It can be involved in riots. And so that's another sense. It's the same way, a different way of saying the same logic, right? That a period of circulation and a surplus population where production has declined is going to be a period where the way people are able to intervene is in that space of circulation through those kinds of struggles and not through the strike weapon. Okay. I said a lot, I'm out of breath, uh, and I'm uh, turning
running over the, the lecture, the microphone, the, the chat column to your questions, uh, which I may or may not have answers to, but maybe you'll be able to answer them among yourselves. Uh, so, um, so I have a question. I really have no idea how to pronounce the name. Abiezer asks, uh, is there a riot prime sequence correlated with the circulation phase at the end of the British Empire cycle? Um, and I uh, agree that's an important question. I actually don't have the data on that. That's research that still is before me to do. The, I mean, the move I'm trying to make is uh, to take the Aridian framework, but also to modulate a little bit into making a claim that the capital full scale or capital full stop, the history of capitalism in the West, in the capitalist core, can be divided into this, these, these three steps, uh, mercantile, uh, industrial, financial, with sub-steps in, in between. Uh, so I sort of want to make a claim for capital to core, uh, but I think that uh, Abbey is just quite right that it's specific to Britain in in their financialized phase, which happens. You know, Brit Britain has a huge economic crisis that begins in 1872 or 73. That's their signal crisis, uh, and starts to shift toward finance. Then to the point where T. S. Eliot, American-born but British citizen, refers to the the British Empire as a nation of bookkeepers uh, in 1922, I believe. Uh, the question of whether we have an increase in riots then, I think is a totally reasonable question and it's gonna have to be part of my research uh, um, program that I, that I head toward. Kathleen Ruiz wants to know, um, does the sequence keep repeating? I'd have to say which sequence? You mean, you mean, do we go riot, strike, riot, prime, strike, prime? Well, m maybe. To believe that, we'd have to believe that there's going to be a next big cycle of accumulation and a big industrial takeoff somewhere in the globe. I think there's reasons to, to be skeptical about that. That's a possibility. And for quite a period of time, everyone was talking about, well, China, of course, is the new workshop to the world. There'll be the new global hegemon. They'll restart production, global profit rates will take off again. People really believe that for a while. It seems less and less likely. Here's some anomalies um, that uh, uh, Arigi has pointed out and other people have pointed out. The first thing is, let's not overhype China's productive capacity. It's been adding labor, but it has not been adding labor in the productive sector. The productive sector, industrial production in China, has actually been declining slightly year over year for the last five years, while the service sector has been increasing in China. So there's actually not a big increase in industrial production in China. Two, there's a huge anomaly that Arigi points out, which is that in the past, uh, every outgoing hegemon has been the creditor that's loaned all its finance capital money to the incoming hegemon, right? That was true of the Genoese bankers uh, funded the rise of the United Provinces, the finance of the United Provinces funded the rise of the British Empire. The British Empire's bankers funded the rise of the U.S. Empire, the building of its industrial capacity. So we would think the U.S. Empire would be, by that same repeating logic, a creditor nation funding the rise of some other new hegemon. But as I'm sure you know, nothing could be farther from the case. The United States is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. So we seem to have seen, come to a an anomaly, if not an inversion of the entire structure, where it no longer seems clear that this mechanism whereby a vastly wealthy but declining uh, hegemon loans out a vast amount of uh, finance capital to start the production somewhere else. That's just not happening. So it's not clear to me. I don't, I mean, if I, if I had utterly uh, a lack of shame and an absolute courage, I would make some bold predictions. Uh, but I actually just don't know if there's going to be another cy cycle of global industrial accumulation. I'm skeptical. Uh, and in saying I'm skeptical, skeptical about that, I'm saying 
I'm very open to the possibility that we're going to get a, a substantial underlying transformation of global arrangements in the next 50 or 100 years. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be good. Uh, the collapse of capitalism as we knew it, uh, I think, is actually quite threatening and quite frightening. I wouldn't fight to defend it, but I think there's potentially quite uh, more disturbing uh, directions things could go. Uh, but I think that we're up for, depending on, depending on our age, uh, we're going to live through some astonishing global volatility, uh, I believe. Uh, a couple of people have said thank you. Have said thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, hi, it's Daniel. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. I can hear you great. Hey, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple um, questions, and, and the reading that you had us look over was really helpful for understanding how in a period of what Arigi calls domination compared to hegemony, um, what he says is struggles from below cre enhance the contradictions of the transition, right? And it seems to me that one of the logical um, next steps, which is what you're doing, is actually to examine in the previous three transitions the role of like um, both on the subjective level of like the agents that were the provocateurs uh, and as well as the forms of these riots that enhance the contradictions that under a period of domination where you had a kind of waning late finance transition, it seems to me that your argument is that the riot takes on this sort of like super central uh, dominance as a sort of main tactic. However, I wonder, and I know next week we're going to sort of look at this, I wonder what you've seen, because in, in some sense, I think the transition from British to U.S. Uh, almost, uh, almost seems to me as less uh, informative uh, than the, the Dutch transition. And I think you were alluding to that as well um, for, for, for perhaps a number of reasons. But, but I guess... Um, the Erigian framework, it also, it also seems to me that Hart and Negri kind of do have a point, you know, in, in the sense of like, how do we use it to gauge events? And I wonder what you would say to, to that. I and mean, you sort of addressed it, but, um, how do we use that framework to step outside of this very positivistic, um, almost, um, total cycle that seems to, Repeat, even though Arigi mentions in his postscript that uh, we're, we're currently witnessing things of U.S. domination that are sort of tripping up his formulas, so to speak. Right. So perhaps we're in a period of sort of U.S. Do global domination and we don't really know where we're headed. And then the Arigian framework needs to be sort of paused and sort of like, can we even use it? So I think for the for the very present moment, my question is sort of. Is this is this Arigian framework sort of ultra relevant or is it only relevant insofar as it can tell us like, yes, the, the riot is central, but sort of what else can it tell us? And perhaps what else can these previous periods uh, of transition tell us? And I know I packed a lot in there, but I'm sort of just I'm 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 absorbing it myself. So uh, my apologies. Uh, yeah, I just think you. I mean, what? I, I'm not sure what category of thing you want to be told by, by this, uh, which is to say, I don't tend to think that history provides us any instructions or, or roadmaps. I don't, I, so I, I'm not expecting to be told too much. What I, what I'm interested in understanding is, um, the proper categories to conduct an analysis by, and that's why I, Want to make this sort of make these categories of circulation and production and the kinds of struggles we can understand in them to be primary, uh, and I, you know, I, that's when I say I'm interested in description, not prescription. That's part of it because I think prescription is is very difficult and perhaps uh, foolhardy. Uh, um, so what I really want is to, is to understand the categories. I, so so what Arigi tells me is not that there's good. I mean, so Arigi tells me specifically that 
if there's going to be another global hegemon, it's going to be because they can put means of production and uh, uh, labor power together at a, at a ratio very different from the one we have. There'll, it'll be a high, la like high percentage labor content. So in technical Marxian terms, low a low technical composition of capital. Um, and so to know sort of where to look for possibilities. But the, the thing he tells me once I shift his model to the model I'm working with, which is a Rigian, but not a Rigi's, uh, it tells me the kinds of struggles that are going to be possible for people that we're going to see. And, you know, so the thing I'm interested in is like, is, is moving away from moralization around riots where people are like riots are bad because they're violent or riots are bad because they're ineffective or riots are bad because they don't have a ruling idea, which is sort of actually uh, would be bad to use skepticism is that there's no ruling idea which mobilizes them. So instead of judging riots, just say, listen, all we can have is circulation struggles. Well, no, I, I think strikes will still happen. I think labor is very important. I think that if there's not struggles in production uh, and that, that that sector is quiescent, uh, there's very little political hope. Uh, but I think that we're you know, increasingly bound to see this category of struggle, which I'm calling circulation struggles. I think it asks us to yeah, con consider the question we we'll talk about this next week of uh, reproduction rather than production. Rather than production. Uh, and uh, and after 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 someone has to, sorry, I had to tweak my microphone to kill the echo. Uh, um, and and that's, that's like, that's enough telling. I'm not quite sure what else it is you, you want to be told. No. Um, <laughs> No, that's that's that, no. I think I think I, I I fully understand the distinction between descriptive versus prescriptive, and I don't really have a desire for prescriptive analysis because what we couldn't really do much with that outside of sort of magical thinking um, or mystical thinking. What what I was actually wondering was sort of in the um, the stuff I've read on Arigi and, and Bev, Beverly Silver's work, um, Chaos and Governance, uh, which is a, a fabulous text and really sort of like the most up to date published in 1999, but still reads as if it's like absolutely relevant for today. Um, what, what I found there was that um, transitions are like elongated over time when they enter into a period of domination, precisely because um, under classes in forms of riots, but other social struggles exacerbate the situation for the elites and elites then have to make a decision about who they uh, partner with in the transition. And so this whole idea of the mantra of the 1% is actually like very compatible with a Regian framework because the question now is on the elites, just as it was on the elites in the British and the Dutch period. Like, I see. And, I see. and therefore I find it like extremely interesting to go back and look at these transitions and see how the relationship between elites uh, and their partnering with the middle class or not partnering with the middle class. I mean, we just saw Syriza was elected in part because the elites refused to partner with the middle class. They fully uh, took a position of utter domination. And, you know, in the United States, we have a situation where elites know very well, I think, to appease the middle class in, in, in a certain sense. Yeah, I guess uh, yeah, some, some people might debate that. Um, okay, so I, I guess I was, you th I was thinking more along those lines. So, yeah, let me, let me offer a quick response to that. And I know David has a question pending and we've, that, that may run us out of time. But yeah, so this may actually be a place where I break a little bit from Beverly Silver. So Beverly Silver was uh, Giovanni Rigi's co-author. They're also married. Um, she has survived him, and she's a she's a friend of mine who's actually I, this this project started because she invited me, um, knowing me only as a literary scholar, she invited me nonetheless to take part in this uh, social sciences historical association project with her, and, and I'm deeply grateful to Beverly Silver. Uh, now I'm going to just disagree, <laughs> just totally disagree with her. Um, she has an account which is very much of a, a pendulum account, drawing pretty heavily on on Carl Polanyi, in which so capital uh, generates as much profit as it can from labor. Labor gets increasingly unhappy. Labor fights back when it's 
being exploited to a certain degree. Uh, capital has to give in. Uh, it purchases the social peace with a certain amount of social, uh, uh, social, the social wages. Um, that decreases its profit margin more and more. It enters into crisis. It has to go back to intense exploitation, which is that moment of domination. Um, the workers are compelled to accept this for a while. Then it gets too onerous. They fight back. And it's just an oscillation between uh, different management styles of capital, and, and two in particular, one with, of like maximizing exploitation and immiseration until that reaches a breaking point, and then two, allowing for more, you know, a space of greater sort of social peace until capital can no longer afford that, and then swinging back. Uh, I don't think that's right. Um, it, its assumption is that the limit on capital's capacity to generate profits is the so-called profit squeeze theory, which is that labor is taking too high a percentage uh, in wages of the profits that are being generated. And that that's the main drag on capital that it has to fight against or periodically give into for social reasons. And I just think that's a mistake. Uh, I, I think that the Marxian account in which the thing that drags down capital's capacity to profit is this expulsion of labor and the production of surplus population is a more accurate account. So for Beverly, she would still locate the arena of struggle with this industrial proletariat, right, that's fighting for more and more labor share, or, uh, uh, wage share or whatever. Whereas me, I would claim, and I realize this causes orthodox Marxists no end of uh, annoyance, I would claim that surplus population, the lumpen proletariat, as Marx said, increasingly becomes the revolutionary subject, people who are excluded from capital, not people who are uh, increasingly exploited by capital. Now, I realize that only answers part of your question. That framework of elite alliances, that's largely drawn from the work of two French economists, Dumenil and Levy, who have actually a very nice sort of uh, chart of the development of capital in which they claim there's essentially three <laughs> pos pos positions. The position of, of the capitalist, the managerial class, so he just, they don't say middle class, but they say the managerial class, and then the laboring classes. And there's shifting alliances. So you have periods where uh, capitalists successfully ally with the managerial class, periods where the managerial class throws in with the laboring classes, uh, and you tend to get restructurings after major crises. And again, this is a model that I'm not sure I entirely believe in. Uh, it actually proposes a degree of sort of free agency uh, you know, um, on the part of capital that I think is probably somewhat less true. Oh, please don't put up links about me on the sidebar, Sigrid. <laughs> um, uh, um, and I think capital tends to be compelled to do things more than it sits around scheming who it's gonna, gonna ally with. Uh, um, but yeah, the question of pressure from below and, it, and its role, I think is a significant one. For me, what I'm interested in negotiating is not so much whether there's pressure from below and how, who the alliances are, but um, the question of what the below looks like, right? Whether if, if the below really clearly was the industrial proletariat in 1930, which I think is inarguable across, across the Western world, um, I don't think it is anymore. And so I'm really interested in that question uh, more than the question of sectoral alliances, which strikes me as a somewhat limited and limiting political, political question. The term in which I think domination is relevant goes back to that carrot stick model I set forth earlier, which is to say, Arrighi's domination is also coercion, right? There's a period of hegemony at a global level. Uh, where nations go along with the hegemon because it's worth it to them. And when that stops happening, they have to proceed, not just locally, not just at the question of, uh, you know, Occupy Wall Street, right, and sending in the riot cops, but globally. Uh, they have to uh, uh, proceed via coercion. And so we see, for example, the inability of the U.S. to get other nations to go on, its, you know, the endless cycle of, of uh, adventures in um the Middle East and Afghanistan and so on. And, the, and, and like each time we start a new war, fewer and like the coalition of the willing turns out to be like six dudes from New Zealand, you know? And uh, that, that's exactly that model in which hegemony has collapsed. No one wants to go along with us. And all we can do is like threaten people with force. And that exists at a local level too. One of the things that was shocking to me about university struggles in the US in 2009 
where tuition got raised very swiftly in a lot of places and students started to fight back, making fairly mild demands, right? Like, please don't raise tuition 32% this year. That's too fast. We can't handle it. And they would have some kind of protest and immediately there'd be riot cops, helicopters, canine squads, and it's extraordinary overreaction. I think that overreaction is exactly the same as, as indicating that we're in a period of domination, of coercion, right? Where there's just, there's no way to buy um, people's complicity. They can't afford it, right? The, this fancy, the money's out there and we just need to fight hard enough and, and whatever, whatever sort of services we want will be funded again, it's rubbish. The money's just not out there. Uh, the, it, there's no social surplus being generated. Uh, and uh, so as a result, every struggle, even a quite minor struggle, is going to be met with massive uh, uh, military force, which is why I think it's, it's, it's at this point in history foolish to make minor demands. You're going to be facing guys with guns no matter what demand you make. So I think people should be making quite big demands, given that it's not like small demands or just people are going to grant them. The response is going to be total because it can't be it can't be granted. So that tells us a lot, actually, about uh, what kinds of struggle might be advised, uh, what, what's going to be necessary, what the limits are. All right, I think I've successfully run out the clock. It's twelve o'clock. What do we want? What do we want to do? Can we go over? Over. You are now unmuted. If uh, if it's okay, I think David has sort of a final question. Um, let's, 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 okay. let's do it. Let's do it. Absolutely. Okay. And if Absolutely. I, if I can't have an answer, I'll defer it till next week. All right. Um, actually, there were a couple of points that came up in the in the interim that I just wanted to quickly rattle off. One was um, you were responding to someone and and made the point that. What might uh, come at, that we're entering a period right now that's going to be remarkably tumultuous and uh, uh, may threaten the future existence of capitalism. And you just um, implied some of the ways that you might address that. I was wondering if you might devote maybe 10 minutes to that in the talk next weekend. Um, I don't know if you plan doing that or not, but it just seemed very intriguing what you what you had in mind. I think that's almost all we'll address in the talk next week. Um, I mean, that, oh. that, that may be the fundamental topic is what the, what forms of struggle we might expect and what, what uh, an anti-capitalist struggle and what a, what a, what a breaking apart of capital uh, might look like and might need to look like. That for me is the only topic for next week. Okay, so it, it, it could be that my question is, again, anticipating next week as opposed to something that you can really uh, adequately address right now. But it occurred to me that your model, your model is very intriguing. Circulation, production, circulation, riot, strike, riot. Um, I was wondering if you've done thinking, <laughs> and perhaps I'm way behind you here, um, with regard to extending that even further um, into the realm of course, engaging revolt and revolution. Um, in other words, do you think that they also um, correspond, th that there's a relationship between these different phenomena? And might you also try to apply a model to a broader conflagration of struggle, something beyond riot, uh, along the lines of a full-scale revolt or revolution? Um, have you thought about it in this light at all and about trying to um, look at the interactions or the relations of these different forms to each other? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, um, uh, I mean, I think like all uh, – the, the, am I hearing like a strange barking noise? What is that going on? Yeah, I'm sorry. That's my dog. I'll mute myself. Thanks. Um, I think I probably know how to mute you from here. But I, that feels weird, weird and um, autocratic. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a serious person, as are we all, which is to say I think about revolution all day long. What, what, I mean, what else do you think about if you're a serious person? Uh, I don't think there's enough revolutions in history to treat them as a data set, uh, to, to be honest. I think that people who want to treat revolution, uh, you know, legitimate revolution as, a, as something periodizable, I think there's real, real problems that arise there. 
But at the same time, I don't want to isolate them as utterly un, un, undetermined or underdetermined events in the bad Juvian sense, just like they, they arise in an unforeseeable way. Uh, and I do have actually quite a bit to say about this. Again, I want to defer that till next week. Not so much about whether you can periodize revolution, but about what revolutionary horizons are. So there's a certain model of what a revolution is. Or maybe 1874 on uh, with the, you know, the forming of the SPK. Uh, there's a certain model of what revolution is as proletarian seizure of the means of production. Uh, the seizure of the state and the hypothetical withering away and so on, that I do think is periodizable according to this scheme. I think there's a reason that what revolution is gets defined that way in that period. And I think it's going to be necessary to redefine what revolution is, uh, what it looks like and what its horizons are once you leave a period where production dominates. As I suggested before, that model of the strike as a kind of discipline that's related to the movement uh, you know, mass class party uh, and a kind of party politics and a kind of party revolutionary struggle with a revolutionary party that seizes the state. I think that's historically specific to the period of the strike and the period of production. Uh, so revolution as such, uh, I think, requires a different understanding of what it looks like and what it means and what its horizon is in a period in which production doesn't uh, dominate in the same way. And that's all I'll say for now. I think I want to re leave the rest for next week, if that's okay. Great. You are now on mute. Great. I want to uh, welcome everybody to give Joshua a round of applause, a, a digital round of applause, a virtual round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank and, you all. Uh, Thank you all. So much. Yes. Okay. Really grateful. Okay. I will see you all. Okay. See you all. Probably some of you. Uh, uh, Monday at 10 o'clock, and we'll celebrate Valentine's Day. Ah, beautiful. <laughs> awesome. Bye. Bye, all. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye. You are currently the only person in this conference.